Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker betting show. This is the York preview. We have the Dante coming up this week and plenty of other brilliant racing. I'm your host, George Ellick, and I'm joined today by two expert guests. One, we're used to having him here. It's Odds Checker's very own tipster, Andy Holding, and backed by popular demand for his second appearance in two weeks, it is Rory Delaghi. Rory, I'll come to you first here because we know about Andy. We, we speak to him the whole time. You know, we're, we're done with hearing about his record at certain tracks. How, how do you normally find this uh, this meeting and how do you normally find York? Never that easy to sort of crack the draw at York, yeah. I find. But it's always important to try to work that out. But if you focus on um, um, on pace and draw, you do pretty well. The angle that I've always tried to use is where everyone expects a, a very low draw to be a big advantage on the round, uh, the round course. That's that's certainly true um, at some trips, but not a, the, the extended mile and a quarter, for example, and the Ebor trip. Horses drawn very wide have done, you know, have done well um, countless times there. So um, um, I forget the name of the Ebor winner from a couple of years ago. Who? Um, that's my uh, job. I'll be on it. Yeah, <laughs> um, the Shake Hand Dance horse, who I thought was an absolutely tre- tremendous bet. In that race, but no one wanted to touch him because he was drawn. I think he was drawn widest of all, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. And he got a lovely ride from Jim Jim Crowley, who, who just ruled him as if the draw wasn't a problem, uh, and won it won it really nicely. Um, so it's it's Muntaha. Sorry, Muntaha. Muntaha. Yeah. Yeah. It's never easy you, remembering the names of Shake Hampton horses, is it? No. But why do you no. think that is, Rory? I mean, there's a lot. There's been lots of conjecture and uh, discussion about that round track draw at York. Um, and what why it does favour the outside? It, it, I mean, it almost goes against you know your, your your perception of how draws often work out. Is, is it because the the ones on the outside run on a, if you like, a fresher strip, for the, the thick end of sort of three four furlongs down the back before they they sort of cross over and meet meet onto the the, the round track proper? Is 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 it, is it that much of an advantage? Do you think? It's it's a possibility. Yeah, there's no there's no blindingly obvious reason um, why it is, but it's a very fair track, York. Obviously, at times um, uh, when the ground gets softer, they tend to sort of come across to the stand side in the uh, in the straight anyway. But I think you've got a, a point there. You know, that's if everyone knows they want to be um, stand side in the straight, then it's a, it's about getting a good position um, coming out of the back straight. But it may well be that the ground is more poached towards the rail, and it's the horses who are able to race wide. Who aren't mm. losing that much ground? There is, and people sometimes get confused about how much ground you you lose if you race wide. If you race wide and you're not impeded by other runners, um, you're losing you, you know you're losing a few feet. You're not losing you know you're not losing half a furlong. And some people seem to think you are. You lose a lot more ground when you um, when your 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 run is impeded by other horses or you're compromised by other horses in front of you and you can't make a move. There's nothing worse than having a horse going well and being stuck in a pocket. Uh, whereas if you're and again, often at York, it's about striking for home at the right time. And of mm. course, you can only really strike for home when you've got a bit of daylight as well. And it certainly it certainly helps in that regard. Um, it's got a reputation as a front runner's track as well, which is, you know, true to some degree, but not an absolute, not an absolute truth. And they can go too fast there in certain handicaps as well. So you, you, you've got to treat every race as it, on its merits. Look, look to see what the shape looks like. Um, see what you know, common wisdom seems to throw out. And sometimes it's the horses that are automatic throw outs for a lot of people that I want to look at twice. And you know, you, by definition, you end up backing a lot of losers that way, but you end up getting value winners as well. Yeah, well, we're recording this at half past seven on Monday evening. So on, on sorry, on Tuesday evening. So on the eve of the first day's racing and about two hours ago, racing at Weatherby was abandoned 12 miles away from York after a, a deluge of rain. Andy, I know that you have every single weather app on your phone. What's <laughs> it looking like ready for, for this week at York? Um, I think we're in April, not May, aren't we? I think it's yeah. early showers. Um, I had a biblical sort of hailstorm stroke thunderstorm halfway through my afternoon broadcast on William Hill, which uh, led to a power cut for sort of four oh, no. hour. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we've had similar developments um, over in um, uh, North Wales. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's just localised, isn't it? Down the road, they've had nothing. And, you know, you get uh, a, a proper meaty damp or um, another 10 miles for, further east-west, whichever way the compass is. So, yeah, any, anything can happen in York. And... <laughs> It's the one thing you don't want going into a big meeting. Obviously, we're going to discuss this. We're going to try and 
almost predict what what's going to happen. Try and get ahead of the ahead of the game. Try and predict what's going to happen weather-wise, which is impossible. But, but I think I think if we go into it thinking it's going to be pretty much good to soft uh, for for the start of day one, and you know it, it could get progressively worse throughout the meeting, depends on um, like I said the the, the uh, look of the draw. Yeah, well, we'll get into the racing now. As I mentioned, we are recording this on Monday evening, which means that, sorry, we are recording this on, I'm so used to talking to you, Andy, on a Monday that it's, no, it feels yeah. strange that it's a Tuesday. Um, we're recording this on Tuesday evening, uh, so there's not going to be long between the time this gets released and Wednesday's racing. So if you are uh, listening to this or watching this on Wednesday and, and you don't really want to skip through, if you just skip about 10 or so minutes, you'll get through to, to Thursday stuff. But we're going to do it in chronological order because the racing on Wednesday is is, is great and we need to we need to do it justice. And we're going to go through and just cover the the um cover the the the, the group one racing, the group two racing, uh, and a couple of listed races in there as well. And then we'll do any other business for the handicaps and the maidens at the end of each day as well. And that means we're going to kick off uh, with the on the 240, the Duke of York Clipper Logistics Stakes. Um, that is the 240 on Wednesday, where Art Power is the seven to two favourite. That's with William Hill. Sorry, that's with Bet365. Uh, Oxted is four to one. Starman five to one. Molotham eight to one. Nahar ten to one. Final Song eleven to one. Summerhand twelve to one. Twenty two to one. Bar and Rory. We haven't seen uh, Art Power or Starman since Champions Day last year. Um, making a return here how do you see this uh this first race we're going to be covering uh, on the podcast and video going uh, at york um it looks it looks reasonably straightforward in that um the pace appears to be up the center of the track emiratiana uh, i would have thought brando if he doesn't if he doesn't uh, miss the <coughs> kick um will be handy so that looks like um <clears throat> generic pace up the center um oxted and art park and go forward um as well from from slightly higher draws um, there doesn't seem to be any obvious trap in here. Um, the question is, of course, the ground. Um, if if the the rain we've seen hits um, York overnight, it would be a big question, I think, for Starman. Mm. Um, not that he's not that he's not certain to handle the ground, but his only disappointment came on, on very soft ground at Ascot. Um, a lot of horses disappointed Ascot, of course. Um, so it may have been track related. It may just have been that that was a you know that was a big step up for a very promising but very inexperienced horse. Um, but um, when your only bad run comes in, on your only try on soft ground, that's in the back of your mind that that um, the ground may be an issue there. Um, I'm I'm very keen on Art Par. I think um, aside, from, I think the the race looks fine for him set up wise. Um, but essentially, I'm with him because I thought all through last season that he was essentially this year's horse. I thought he did well last season. Obviously, he bolted up. On his reappearance, went on and won at Royal Ascot. Um, went to Ireland and picked up a decent prize there. Uh, before um, flopping in the Nunthorpe, was his only his only moderate run. And I suppose you could be worried about the fact that, that came at York. Um, but he's got course form already. The Nunthorpe was just uh, it was a strange race. The Nunthorpe last year um, it, it broke apart a little bit. Um, the wind was kind of uh, behind them and side on and quite strong as well. And a few horses just struggled to get to get involved. Um, and he was dropping back to, to, to a quick five furlongs and just wasn't at the races early on. And um, he seemed to like a greyhound losing sight of the hair. Um, he just seemed to lose interest in the race. Uh, but he bounced back with two solid efforts in, in group ones after that, um, back over six furlongs uh, with digging the ground. Conditions will be absolutely perfect for him here. But essentially, it's not so much. I think his form is good enough to win this race. Um, because I think the, the July Cup form is slightly overrated last season. It's a standout um, on Oxted's form. And overall, if you just produced the one, two, three in the July Cup and said, this is a Group 1 race, you'd be slightly dubious about it. Um, so, yeah, I think I think Oxted is, is slightly overrated on the July Cup form. And he hasn't quite hit his straps really since. So I'm a, I'm a little wary of him. But essentially, this is about believing that Art Parr will improve a lot this season. Uh, that's the view that I took last summer. Um, and until I'm proven wrong, I've got to ply on with it. <laughs> Art Power seven to two with Bet three six five is short to short as eleven to four elsewhere. I should say now, do download the Odds Checker app so you can follow all of the races we're talking about with the very best prices, which we'll be discussing. So yeah, if you don't use Odds Checker and you're backing at eleven to four, seven to two available elsewhere, you need to be checking that. Also, the best place terms, bookie offers, and some of the best tipsters in the game, including the man I'm going to ask now for his view on this race, Andy Holding. 
Yeah, um, I think our power is only going to go one way in the market. Uh, he's currently 72 at the top price. As Roy said, he has a hell of a lot going for him. More predominantly, for me anyway, course form. I think that's very, very important. I think it's taken me the thick end of 20, 25 years of betting at York to work out that, um, similar to Ascot, you want to be looking at course specialists here that have got proven track form, particularly on the straight track. Uh, and Art Power has got that in the bag. His only poor run last year was when he was taking off his legs in the non-thought by Batash, but um, we know the kind of fractions that Batash goes. And three-year-old against the older horses on, on relatively, I think it was quick, slightly quick ground that mm-hmm. day as well, um, found him out. But either side of that, he's, you know, his form on the soft ground was, was excellent. Um, he's running the Haydock Park Sprint, Balbon, nothing wrong with his run beyond Glenshire and Champions Day. He's also won first time out, which was last year, which we're always already pointed out. So he goes well fresh. You'd imagine that he used to be got him revved up for this. You know, this would be his targets, his local, one of his local tracks, the yard's in good form. And and he's nicely drawn right down the middle, which is what you want. Um, so I, th- I think that uh, seven or two could be under pressure. Um, one at a bigger price, well, I'll just throw him to the mix. Um, again, another horse that's shown a liking to, to the nose mile before. Was Lady in France, of course, uh, owned by sponsors of the race, Clipper Logistics. So that immediately draws attention to uh, Carl Burke's filly. And, um, you know, I thought she had a, a fair season last year. She ended up running quite well at Longchamp towards the back end beyond a, a nice horse called Wooded. Um, I think that was actually on... Um, that was the Labay, wasn't it? That was the Labay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah it was the Labay, yeah. Um, and, you know, it looks as though most of her, 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 her runs last season suggested that she'd be stretching out nicely to six furlongs this year. She ran well over five and a half uh, once, so... Um, I, I don't see that being too much of a problem. She's 33 to 1, you know. I, I think that's um, more, more than fair value. Could have done with a better draw. Don't like being drawn out on each wing here at York. I think you need to be right down the middle, as Roy said. Drawn 1, drawn 12. Like, um, uh, what's the other one that's drawn 1? I did make a note of it, and I've now forgot it. What's drawn 1? Oh, Final that's Song. Final Song. Uh, yeah, the, the mm. good Alfin horse. I, I don't think that's... Uh, uh, and it as can be seen as a positive. Um, yeah, but at the prices, maybe may worth a little bit of a shot at a big price. But um, yeah, art power for me as well. I'd be uh, I'd be quite keen on that at the, at the current price. Yeah, dust off the old bet victor account. Thirty three to one for Lady in France uh, standout price there. Twenty to one shortest uh, with bet three six five uh, a long shot there for Andy. Twelve runners at the moment. A couple of firms sticking their neck out and going four places. Uh, Sky bet and Betfair sportsbook at the moment. Um, but Art Power getting yeah a, a positive mention from both and certainly from the one to follow for this season from Rory. Uh, on then to the Musadora, a really interesting heat here where all the money was for Teona, the Rogerian, uh, the Rogerian uh, horse at six to into six to four from three to one previously in the week. Noon Star, who'd been well backed for the Oaks, now all the money for Noon Star. Uh, now seven to four best price for Bet Three Six Five. I think on the exchanges, Noon Star is currently trading as favourite. Mystery Angel fifteen to two, Snowfall fourteen to one, Aurea sixteen, Sanita 16s, thirty three to one, uh, Glen Artney and Quiet Assassin a hundred to one. So Andy, you, were you? I mean, let's. The market's basically gone one way, and then it's kind of gone the other way. Uh, which side would you would you think is the right way? Um, there's a little bit of recency bias with Noonstar. I think um, I think we need to say that straight off the bat. Um, it's been a while since Tiana ran. She didn't. Um, she, her last run was in November, um, and and obviously the Noonstar uh, performance has been picked up by uh, many good judges, many time film time merchants. Um, Tom Segal's tipped Noonstar, I think, as he Roy for the Oaks, off memory. Um, he's obviously got a hold of that time figure. We've got Noonstar running a 96, which is, again, off memory, the best um, middle distance time figure by a three-year-old filly we've got this season, closely matched by Dubai Fountains running in the, in the Cheshire Oaks last week. And considering that was just a, a novice filly stakes at Weatherby, it obviously opens your eyes up to thinking, my God, this this should be a good race. So much so that I tipped Loving Dream um, in the uh, Lingfield Oaks trial on Saturday, thinking I was doing the right thing. And in my tracker was always called Lemon Sher- uh, Sherbet Lemon, which was languishing at 25, 33 to 1 overnight. And like an absolute complete idiot, I never put a half a point win up on Sherbet Lemon just as a bit of a cover bet. And lo and behold, 
she went and turned the form around with Loving Dream. So um, you can tell what kind of form I'm in at the moment. I'm missing 25 <laughs> to 1 winners. Yeah. Um, Frank Litt, who I put up last week, uh, going at a big price, sort of 7 to 2 ish, went off 11 to 10, ran well at Kempton. We would have seen moments of beauty, the fifth horse at Weatherby tonight, had the meeting not been abandoned, but that was well back fives into twos. So I think everyone's cottoned onto this form line. And the way that Noonstar quickened and hit the line, you know, she looked mighty impressive. She's going to get the truth. She's going to get a mile and a half, but, you know, mile, mile, um, mile and a quarter and change here at York could be right up a street. She likes to be ridden quite handy. You know, she's usually on the shoulders of the pace. And I think that's where um, Kingsgate will be uh, told to ride her. And um, it'd be a shock if either her or, or Tiona don't win this because Tiona was also mighty too impressive, not only on the eye, but we got her doing a 95 in a, again, a Newcastle maiden. So it's quite rare that we get big figures such as that in maiden or stroke novice races. They usually only come in the group races. So those two figures are already telling us that Noonstar and Tiona are ready for group races. Hence, they are coming here to find out if they are genuine Oaks contenders. The chances are that we'll see if one of them wins and wins impressively, the winner usurping Santa Barbara's Oaks favourite. Um, I've got a sneaky feeling that's going to happen. They could both run brilliantly, like go all the way to line, only a half a length or a length between them. And both of them are viable contenders for for um, the derby. Which is the better out of the two? If I'm being honest, based on our numbers, I, I wouldn't really know. Um, my slight preference would be for Noonstar, I suppose, because... She has had a recent run. It's on the turf, and we don't know whether Tiona A acts on the turf stroke, good to soft ground, whereas Noonstar will probably um, um, contend with that. Can you, um, just to, before I, I ask Rory for his views on the race, I'm just looking at the Oaks market now, Tiona is the five, is five to one second favourite, Noonstar eight to one. Can you see, you know, given that they, they take each other on tomorrow and currently trading on, on the exchange as Noonstar is favourite. Can you see why there is that price discrepancy for, for the Oaks? Is, um, it just, is it just an out-of-date market? I, I'm surprised that Tiona is as short as she is because at, at this present moment in time because she hasn't actually quite done it yet. We, we, it's been such a while since the wraps were taken off of her. Um, she's almost gone down to five to one because of other horses falling away, falling by the wayside. Um, and like I say, I think if Noonstar get Noonstar, I think will go a favourite tomorrow. And if she does beat Tio, and as I said, I, I think she could easily be close to favourite, or if not favourite, um, it's, it's obviously supposition. And, and, we, and we, we, you, you're basing your theory on the horse winning wildly impressively here. It might not be the case, but um, <coughs> these, these are the best two fillies outside of Group Company. And as I said before, when we did the previous podcast for York, I haven't seen anything in this in this division, particularly from Ireland. They've all been disappointing. The Salsa Bull Stakes hasn't worked out well. Um, the supposed wonder horse of Aidan O'Brien's hasn't really gone on from last season, the horse I fancied. Um, and Aidan O'Brien's got Santa Barbara to fly the flag, and she didn't look like, to my eyes anyways, if mile and a half is going to be um, inducing a huge amount of improvement. So, yeah, as I said, I think I think Noonstar and Tiana, they, they've, got, um, they've got the world at their feet here. If uh, one of them can, um, or both of them can do do a good job here tomorrow. So noon star just about, I think, getting the nod from Andy there. Yeah, so... only, yeah, it's a marginal thing. I mean, like I said, when you've got time figures 96, 95, yeah, um, yeah, of course. there's no chasm between them. It's, it's virtually impossible to pick them. Rory, have you got a stronger view on these two? Not, not really. I think, you know, Andy summed it up very well. Um, the bottom line is it's very hard to make a, a strong case for one of them over the other. Mm-hmm. You can argue which one should be favourite. And essentially that's, as you can see, with the market flip-flopping, um, you know, the people in different camps as to who should actually head up the market. Um, there is there is the issue of race fitness, which I think pro- probably sways it in the end. Um, but they're both very promising. Um, they both look like there's a, a lot more to come from them. Um, and one of them should win. But then again, what are they? They're about 4 to 11 combined, aren't they? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the question is, mm-hmm. do you fancy back in a 4 to 11 shot here? And then you're basically having a coin toss as to which one you want to be with, unless you know <laughs> something that we don't, mm. uh, which you may do, you know. Um, that, that would be a, a, um, the difficulty in the race for me. It's going, to be, it's going to be a very interesting one in terms of, of the Oaks. Um, I thought that um, 
hopefully eight go to post because it might be an interesting race yeah. from the XY point of view because uh, I'd be against Mystery Angel. I mean, she's a lovely filly and she won the uh, the Pretty Polly last time out, but I don't think the Pretty Polly was much of a race. And I think she'll be vulnerable there. Uh, she's in at, at around 15 to 2. Um, I thought um, I thought Aria was quite interesting. You know, if you ended up getting 20 to 1 about her, I'd be tempted each way. Uh, she's 16, I think, best price at the moment. Um, she ran in what was a sent, what was meant to be a coronation stakes trial at, Royal, at Ascot the other day. They had that Royal Ascot trials meeting, which I think is, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of, of that rebranding of the meeting, to be honest. So they had a Phillies trial for, for Royal Ascot. Um, but there were no, I don't think any of the Phillies in the race had an entry in the coronation stakes, but lots of them were entered in the Oaks and in the Ribblesdale and things like that. Um, Aria was, was second. Um, she came from a fair way off the pace. I thought she shaped arguably like the best filly in the race. She's she's got a bit of physical scope about her. I, I'm, I don't think she has, um, I don't think she has an Oaks entry. Um, she's got two entries at the moment: this and the Michael Seeley Memorial, um, which obviously she won't be taking her entry up in that. Um, this might not be her. She's obviously running over a mile last time and doing her best work late. She's not guaranteed to want this trip. Um, but I think there's a chance that um, it will suit her. She's related to horses like um, Beat the Bank, so she might be a miler, um, and she doesn't have the fancy entries. And I think as a result of that, she might end up being a big price. I wouldn't be confident about it, but I, I thought she looked like the type of filly to do a lot better, um, and she might nick a place at a price, but that's a that's a pretty weak point of view. <laughs> Aurea, 16 to 1, uh, pretty much across the board. And I think there will be people looking for an each-way bet, especially when you've got two horses that might be maybe a little bit over bet and who could at least take each other on for something to come up and, and pick up the pieces. Um, anything else on Wednesday before we move on to Thursday? I mean, plenty, plenty there, Rory, any others catching your eye for, for tomorrow's racing? Um, yeah, one, one or two, um, uh, eye catchers there in the, um, in the opener. I'm again, this is very much price dependent. Um, and I was just looking at the, at the exchange prices earlier on and, Saeed bin Sarur's uh, runner in the opener, um, Dubai Souk. Dubai Souk, yeah, was 22 a, was to a 1. Big price. Yeah, tw- 22 to 1 is too short, but the exchange price suggests that it's going to be uh, a much bigger price. That's, this is the problem with overnight markets. The, the outsiders al- always tend to be a little bit tight, mm. uh, and then in the morning they drift, you know, they often double in price or, or more. So I can see Dubai Souk being a 33 mm. or 1 shot in the, in the morning. Um, and he's... He was arguably disappointing. Well, there's no arguable about it. He was last of three at Musabra last time out. But it was an interesting race because he traded 101 in running. Um, <laughs> and finished he, third. Yeah, he led. <laughs> he was then he was then restrained. Um, the eventual winner went on. And then he's cruised past it with two furlongs to go and kick two or three lengths clear. Um, and then weakened inside the last 100 yards to be... To be he was beaten a length and a half. He wasn't... You know, it's not like he stopped as such. But he didn't quite get home that day. That was only his... Um, his uh, third start since he bolted up in a nursery at Nottingham. Now, I'm a little bit wary of following um, uh, horses based on their two-year-old form at mm. this stage, but the form of that race worked out very well. He was a six-length winner of a soft ground um, Nottingham uh, nursery over a mile and a quarter. Form has worked out well. The third horse, who's been about 10 lengths, won the Chester Vaz last week, for example. Um, Duke of Condicut, I think, was, was the runner-up. Um, and he was then off the track until um, uh, one run at, at Ascot last year. And then he was he looked rusty there. He looked rusty again on his return at Doncaster. Saeed bin Sarur is not particularly good at getting his horses going early. We've seen that for over a decade now. Um, so I think there are reasons to believe that he would have needed a couple of runs. Um, he looked as if all his ability was intact last time out. He looked well, well handicapped for much of the race. The question is whether he's got a physical problem that means he stops later on in his races, or he hasn't been fit. At 33 to 1 or bigger, I would take a chance on him not being fit and looking well handicapped back off 90. But I'd need a big price to get involved, really. So to buy a souk there in the opener for Rory, 22 to 1, best price now, but do not back at that price. Wait till the morning. Chances are, if you're listening to this, given we're recording at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night, it probably will be morning. Um, and have a look at the price then and maybe pull the trigger if 33 to 1 or bigger. Andy, what else is catching your eye on, on Wednesday? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep my um, bets to a minimum or put my powder rel- relatively dry at York um, for reasons I've outlined. It's not one of my favourite punting tracks. But I do like horses that um, 
uh, finished off their races really strong on the on the you know on the round track, and and they they've they run well over a similar style um, of, of track, and that's Newbury last time out. And the horse I uh, I, I quite like is Flying Solo in, in the final race, David Minusiers. Um I was really taken by the way this horse picked up from a, a very uncompromising position at at, um, at the Berkshire track. Um, he'd had a couple of spins prior to that. I think it was on the all weather, and and he was a bit unlucky, but. Um, he went into this turf handicap um, relatively well punted as well. That they 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 backed him from sort of double figures into six. He was up against a horse called Ade, who was supposedly well handicapped from the Simon Crisford stable, and the two of them made a pincer-like movement down the outside as other horses were jostling for position on the inside. And I thought he won with a bit in hand. Um, he was drawn seventeen to seventeen as well, which is a bad starting point. So he's overcome that barrier. But the form of the race has worked out incredibly well since. The Sixth has won, Storting won the Thirst Cunt Cup. Uh, Snow Ocean ran really well at Chester. Uh, Inchicore, the 12th horse, bolted up at Nottingham on Saturday. And Spirit Dancer just got nutted um, in, right on the line at Chester. Even, even the 14th horse, Mr. Poy, um, only just got beat at, um, I think it was Kempton last week. This is as about a red hot as handicap early on in the season as, as you'll find. And I, like I say, I do like horses that are given plenty of chance at York. I often find that, particularly you know on soft ground, they they they, they tend to go too hard from the front and, and the race falls apart at the end. I think he's absolutely guaranteed to get the mile and a half. In fact, I think he's crying out for it. Uh, and I like the way the Manusia horses are just steadily coming to the boil after a, a, a couple of sighters and, and a, um, a lot of them looking as though they needed the run. Um, so yeah, he's he's probably my strongest view tomorrow. Um, He's around about six to one, mm. four or five places on offer. I, I didn't expect him to be, you know, running them down late on. Yeah, six to one, five places is the best you're going to get. That is with Paddy Power or Betfair Sportsbook. A couple of other others actually as well. Mansion Bet, Bet Fred, Betway, Bowl Sports, Ten Bet, and Sport Nation. So a few options and Genting as well. That is, uh, yeah, I have a feeling Andy, the way you're speaking, that could be going up in the uh, in yeah, the he, column know, tomorrow yeah. morning. He, he it, might be the only one I put up. Um, as I said, I tend case. to tread very carefully at York. I'm, it's not a great, like I say, I'm, I'm, I haven't got a great happy hunting ground or a great record there. So I can afford to sort of stick to my tried and trusted formula going at Dundalk mm. for a couple of picks and then <laughs> just bodging in one at York when I, when I think there's suits. a decent form line and, and there's like four or five places on offering a handicap rather than um, sticking up 64 yeah. shots like Moonstar. <laughs> <laughs> the aptly named flying solo then for Andy uh, on Wednesday at York. Uh, on then to the Middleton Phillies Stakes. It's the second race uh, on the card on Thursday at York. And Queen Power is the two to one favourite. Passion five to two. Silence please four to one. Cabaletta fifteen to two. Uh, Shemade is ten to one. And Fraser twelve to one. Uh, come back to you, Rory, for your take on this. Um, yeah, I want to be against the favourite at the prices. Um, she's a talented filly, but she knows a lot. Well, she knows one way of getting beaten, essentially, uh, which is doing doing too much, racing too freely, fighting a jockey, and then just um, being undone late in the day, uh, which she did again on on her uh, later start, which is a good, you know, it's a good performance uh, that second in the in the Dahlia. But I don't think it was a particularly strong Dahlia Stakes um, this year. The winner's a lovely mare, um, but uh, I'm not sure that the bare form. Um, it's quite as good as it looks on paper. It doesn't. Uh, you can argue that that makes her the form pick in the race, but um, she again raced freely and she again didn't really maximise her chance of winning the race. Um, and she's only won once, hasn't she? Mm. Um, mm. Yep. Um, and she was. I think that was a that was a, a Phillies trial at Newbury as well, which is which has worked out some um, uh, worked out very well. Um, but she's not since then. She's she's just been not tractable enough to to progress as she should have she's still showing very good form it's not like she's gone backwards um she is talent wise probably the best filly in this race but um york's not an easy track um if they if they don't want to settle for you uh, it'll give um give sylvester de souza a tough old job um and again you know she's up to an extended mile and a quarter again um it's as, it's as far as she wants to go as well i think um so I, if she's two to one or, or shorter, I definitely want to be against her. Um, for all, she's got the talent to win. Um, <clears throat> Cavaletta, I'd imagine, will um, she's coming back off a of a, uh, a poor run, but I can. There are a lot of horses who ran poorly on British Champions Day on the bad ground. I mean, it was, it was worse than soft 
Yeah. Lone Force has really hated it. Ignore that run, and her form is is pretty uh, solid in the first half of last season. Um, again, she's got winning form at Newbury, uh, which you tend to look for at tracks like this. Roger Varian's flying at the moment, so I'd, I'd respect her chances. Um, and the other one I'd probably throw in there um, because she can't win um, on recent form is Freya, who was down the field in the uh, in the Dahlia Sticks um, last time out. That's not her. Um, that's not her running again. She was. She probably did too much in front that day. Um, as a daughter of Glen Eagle, she will handle. Again, I'm assuming the ground is going to be um, softer than good. Um, that that's maybe that's a dangerous assumption to make. But with with rain around, it's not going to be quick. Um, so with that in mind, I think you know Freya's got plenty of form last season that gives her place claims here at least. Um, you know, certainly you can if you pick the um, the best of the form for all these runners. Freya's got a little bit to find, but she's going to be the rank outsider in the field. You probably get sixteen to one about her, um, and at that kind of price, I'd um, you know, given I want to be against the favourite, I'd, I'd keep her on side at that price. So I think her and Caballetta, maybe not the two likeliest winners in the race, but I think um, you get a little bit more value um, combining the two than backing Queen Power. Quarter of the two, would you be backing them both just win only? Yeah, again, and small stakes as well. It's just a case mm-hmm. of, of you know perceived value rather than um, neither of them have got the best form in the race, but I think they'll appreciate um, the uh, the demands of the race and they should give their running and that gives them a, a chance of winning the race more than the, the current um, odds would suggest. <laughs> Caballetta 15-2 to two with Hills and 365. Freya 12-1 to one at the moment, but as Roy mentioned, as the outsider of six, probably be bigger on the day unless... Um, someone like himself decides to stick him up the night before, then then it might be a different story. Uh, Andy, how do you see this? Yeah, I'm similar to, uh, to Rory at, at the prices. I'd, I'd want to be overlooking um, Queen Power. Uh, I certainly accept, as Rory does, that she's got all the talent in the world and she's run some really good races um, at Group 2, even Group 1 level. Um, but I think I think if she when she uh, puts her um, racing hooves up and she decides to write a, a, a book, an autobiography, she'll call it After, after You, Claude. Um, because I think it's very much a case of um, I'm quite happy to finish second and third. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, based on our overall profile winter run ratio, I'd be looking elsewhere. I'm quite keen on someone that's pleased as a horse. I think she's um, she's got a ton of, ton of talent. And unfortunately, she bumped into another horse who got too much um, quality for at Leopardstown when we last saw, and that was uh, Tiger Moth, uh, as we know, is a, a, very good, uh, a very good horse trained by her now, Brian. Um, but she came out best of the, the fillies uh, in that race uh, when we last saw her. She was due to run at Navan over the weekend, but they took her out because of the ground, and, and the ground was yielding to soft. So, again, another weather watch if you're um, listening to this on um, <clears throat> early Wednesday morning. You have to pay attention to what the ground does, obviously, on the first day and then into the second day. But if it stays OK and the ground seems to be riding all right, fairly uniformed, she should have um, a perfectly decent surface to, to run well. She'll run well on yielding ground. I, I haven't got a problem with that. But, you know, to be, to, to be up the, at their absolute maximum, these horses, they have to have the right conditions. So um, if it's no worse than good to soft, then silence, please, would be the one for me. Silence, please, four to one uh, with most firms at the moment. Uh, both Andy and Rory there looking to take on both Queen Power at uh, two to one and Passion as well. Uh, with some of the outsiders in the field. We'll move on then to the Dante, where high definition at 11 to 4 is about the same price as he was for the Derby about two weeks ago. Uh, Gear Up is 9 to 2. Hurricane Lane, 6 to 1 alongside Royal Champion. Uh, Alan Kerr is 8 to 1. McGallan, 10 to 1. Flying Visit, 12 to 1 alongside Uncle Bryn, 33 to 1. Bar, Andy, I'll stick with you for the big one on Thursday. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that high definition is coming here because we'll get a chance to see what he's really made of. Um, there's been a lot of talk and conjecture about him over the winter, um, which race he'll line up in. But I think this is the right trial for him, really. Um, you know, his best horse tends to come here, um, even though obviously Balshaw Bally's put down a decent marker in the, in the Darren Stan and Bally sacks. I still think that prior to that horse parachuting in from where he was to now, I, I still think this was their derby horse. Um, he's got the size of a physique to be a very, very good middle distance um, cult this season. His two wins were very much against the head at uh, the Curra, which is a tricky track to overcome at the best of times. But first time out, he did it from a very, very difficult position. And if you thought that was a Houdini act, you want to go back and look at his last run. Um, I mean, he was last 
with three furlongs to run. He went all the way right around the outside of the field, gobbled up his opposition within a few bounds. And, um, you know, he left you thinking, my God, how on earth did he manage to do that? Um, he didn't beat any rabbits either that day. You know, the horses like Monasib and, and Snapper Tear, and I think like Ace Aussie was in that as well. Um, mm. You know, it was, a, it was a good field and he left them for dead. Um, the long striding nature, uh, or the galloping nature, sorry, will suit his long striding cadence. Um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing him. Whether he's absolutely 100%, I don't know, because obviously we wanted to sort of deficiencies, doesn't there, of late? Was it the blood count wrong or something like that? You know, um, not ideal, his preparation. But um, of horses I'm looking forward to seeing the most um, at, the, at the days where I think he's the one. Um, would I back him at 11 to 4? Probably not. And, and because of that, because I like him, but I won't back him at the price, probably. Um, it's a race I'll probably just avoid and, and uh, take stock of and, and try and work out what's the, what's the derby horse out of it. The Haggis horse won well at Sandown. His time figure was good. And Uncle Bryn, I thought, got a poor ride in the in the uh, Epsom derby trial there. And he's 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 a nice enough horse to be capable of making some kind of amends and, and bouncing back. Um, but it's a viewing race for me um, in, in the hope that we see a genuine derby contender. Viewing race for Andy. Any bets for you, Rory, at the current prices? Uh, there is, um, and I'll, I'll I'll probably just end up back in this place only on the day that, that the best odds. Um, I, I made I think I, I made the point last week that mm. um, I thought Pythagoras um, is better than his um, his profile suggests. Um, he looks to have plenty of speed. I think he's thirty three to one. Yeah. Um, for this contest, um, obviously only fourth in the uh, in the Blue Ribbon Trial at Epsom. Uh, that form took a knock last week as well, but I think that's solid form, and the, and the the clock suggests it's it's um it's decent form as well. He was a winner at um at Beverly and Ripon last season, and I, and I the impression I got on both of those runs was that he hated the right-handed tracks, um and he then um, he duly got off the mark in a listed race at Pontefract on his, his final um well, not got off the mark he he won a listed race on his final start he was obviously he won both of those races despite failing to handle the bends. Um, and I thought he just needed the run at, at Epsom. Um, I'm told the plan wasn't to make the running with them uh, on that day, just bounced out the stalls well, so Paul Hannigan let him roll. Um, and he just got tired inside the final furlong. Um, he'll come on from the run. He needs to. I mean, it's not like he's only got three or four pounds to find. You, you look at the ratings here. He, he looks less open to improvement than a few of them. And he looks to have, you know, about 10 pounds to find as well. So he's not an obvious one there. Um, but as I said, he's one that I've looked at and I've always thought that he's been better than the bare result in his races. And I think there's a bigger performance in him. He's not a Derby horse. He's not bred to stay the Derby trip. Um, and in a manner of speaking, being trained by Richard Fahey, owned by, by Robert Ogden, this kind of is his Derby. Mm. And I think I think they'll, be, they'll have him keyed up to run uh, the race of his life here. Where they go afterwards is a, a different kettle of fish altogether. So I'm not viewing this as a Derby trial in, in, in betting terms. I'm viewing this as an opportunity for Pythagoras to get amongst them. I know Richard Fahey, is, he's, uh, he tends to be a little bit pessimistic, I think, about his horse's chances. And he said he'd be, he'd be happy to finish in the first six. Um, <laughs> yeah, again, it looks a very strong race. Um, and this horse has it to do on paper. But that's why he's the big prize. And I can see him being ridden um, to, uh, to get a place. And I think they'll be very happy to be on the uh, to be in the winner's enclosure afterwards. So it's a case of finding the best place only price about him. Um, it's not so much. Um, it's not all about glory. It's about nicking a little bit of value. Um, and as I said, I, I, I think there's bound to be at least one or two who are too good for him. Um, but um, if I'm right that he's that he's better than the form that he's shown so far, um, then he will be under bet and therefore there's a way of, of making money out of them. Roy, when you have these place only bets on big price horses like this, do you have a, just a, a very small stake on the win part on, on the exchange or? Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things. If you, if you, you back a horse place only and, um, and it goes and I mean, wins. I tend to, yeah, I tend to back them win only. And then in a couple of different place markets yeah. on the exchange. And then I will try to, um, trade out of the, of the win bet, um, uh, to to ensure that I'm 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 making a, a a minimal loss on the overall bet, so that your best case scenario is you end up with a very small win bet, but you've got good place positions, and your worst case scenario is um, the horse is on place, but you've managed to trade some of that back in the win market, so that you've ended up losing no money or you know mm. only half of your stake. Yeah, interesting, Pythagoras. 
yeah for those who don't use exchange do check it out because there's uh, always an uh, angle there's always a way there's always a way <laughs> in exactly always an angle i just i've only oh, just like, got it rory yeah. I, it's too good i was just right in front of me yeah. and, I've managed, and i've managed to miss it um on then to the uh, the 340 the listed uh westo stakes where an old friend of yours, Andy, from last season, Acklam Express, after mm. um, some stellar runs over at Maidan, uh, is head to the market at nine to four, ahead of Winter Power at three to one, Dexter Bell six to one, After This Bay seven to one, uh, it's International Dream ten to one, fourteen to one bar. And Andy, as I said, Acklam Express um, was a friend of yours last season. How do you assess his chances here? Yeah, I was also a friend of the guy who actually um, purchased this um, off old connections, and um, I was offered a share in him in the very early stages after he won at Hamilton, and, and like a fool, I, I turned it down, and lo and behold, he went from strength to strength, won at Goodwood, won at York, finished fourth at uh, Doncaster in the Flying Childers, um, didn't handle the soft ground at Newmarket, but he's bounced back amazingly, won a lot of prize money over in, um, in Maiden, every time he runs well, it's a, it's a bit of a dagger to my heart, really, to be honest, Um but uh, he has been a bit of a money spinner. Dagger to betting. the heart, but... but, but well, bigger, I'm making sure that I'm making a few quid out of him betting. Um, <laughs> his, odds in, his, his odds in May, Dan, have been 20 to 1, 10 to 1, 40 to 1. And he's hit the frame every time in group 2s, 3s and 1s, respectively. I mean, he's run in the um, in the, the Alcor sprint. Had to be seen to be believed. There was, there's been a massive track bias over in May, Dan, on the straight track. Uh, Centre to near side the whole uh, for the whole uh, winter or uh, the summer. And um, he managed to run his face off to finish. I think he got beat about a length accumulatively, drawn mm-hmm. stall two. I mean, for a three-year-old running against older, older sprinters and the winner is an American horse, who obviously knows the ropes. It's quite a phenomenal run. The, the only question is, um, have those races taken anything out of him? If not, then I very much think he's the one to beat here and the right favourite. Um, he's a course and distance winner as well, which ticks the box that I look for. Horses that run well at the, this York track are all about speed and you have to be able to handle that funky surface they have there. Um, so he, he's proven. He can sweat up down at the start. It's one of his little calling cards or his little traits that if you see him down at the start, actually it's probably a good thing. If he's sweating profusely, it's probably a good thing rather than a bad thing because the times when he's, he has got up into a lather, he's actually he's actually won a run really well. So that's worth bearing in mind. So don't be put off if he does get warm. Uh, but all in all, top class sprinter, very much still going the right way. He, he's definitely been a listed horse. He's basically, he's, he's running a group one. He's in a listed company here. I think the plan is to go to the King Stand Stakes after um, this uh, this race. So that, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed that uh, yeah. Aklam Express can um, can keep going, keep keep chugging along. Anything else you'd you know you'd you'd fancy each way against him? Are you happy just to? Yeah, I think Dexter Bell's one that's open to quite a bit of improvement. That filly did clocked a big number winning winning at Pontefract. She was too green to do herself just his first time out as a tea rod at York, but she's had the York experience. Uh, the form of that Pontefract race, as it stands, doesn't amount to a huge amount, uh, albeit the second horse uh, Barney's Boy uh, Barney's Bay has won a couple of times since. Uh, but it's a huge jump from winning a race at Pontefract to. To York, that's what I'm trying to get at. But she's drawn right in the middle, and with the Ryan horses going really well, she could probably end up being the each alternative to those that didn't want to take a short price about Acklam. Yeah. Do you think she's a five furlong uh, performer? She was always uh, seven on debut, then back to six last time. She showed a hell of a lot of speed at Pronti the day yeah. when she she won that day. She was she knocked the best split times out. There was like bigger staff. Uh, there was a couple of there was definitely an older sprinter that won on that card as well, but she basically ran the last two four four furlongs two furlongs quicker than Bicker Staff, so and her time figure was very good overall. So she did go at a, a proper pace that day. Um, I don't mind horses that actually kind of drop back here at York because I think you need you need a little bit of everything. You need a bit of tactical speed, but you need to stay as well. So it's a really it's quite a funny track. It's a demanding track, even though it's a flat track. That last two furlongs they just seem to like. Seems to go on forever when I'm watching them, mostly with my horses. Um, so yeah, um, I don't think that will be too much of a problem. But yeah, it's worth bearing in mind. It's a good point. Does that make life any easier, Rory? When, when <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I, I, yeah, I think she's very interesting. Um, it's just yeah, the question is whether whether five furlongs is um, a catalyst for further improvement because they obviously thought she'd she's bred to stay um, a mile. She travelled she traveled strongly early on on debut here and then didn't didn't get home as if it was lack of experience or lack of fitness. But I think she just, you know, 
she's just an enthusiastic front runner. And so maybe, maybe five furlongs is exactly what she wants. It's, it's just, it's not always that easy to tell with the horses dropping back to five, whether they'll be taken out of their comfort zone by, by meeting natural five furlong horses. Because I, I think there's a big difference between mm. five and six furlongs. Yeah. Most horses, yeah. There are some horses who are, who are um, uh, adept at both trips. But look at the, look at the, um, the sprinting division. Uh, in the UK, there have been very few horses that have been able to cross over between five and six furlongs and be as good at either trip, really. Mm. Um, you know, Batash, as we've seen, hasn't been. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's a slightly different discipline. Five furlongs is really eyeballs out, just get out the stalls and kick for home. Six furlongs is a little bit of nuance about it. But in fairness, she she ran over five over six last time out as if what she wanted to do was just go out and blaze. So the drop to five might be absolutely perfect for her. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be inclined to, I mean, obviously she, if, it, if the ground comes up soft, um, that'd be an unknown for her as well. But I th I'm inclined to think um, um, that the positives outweigh the negatives with her. Text to Bell, six to one with bet 365 there. Rory, any others that, that catch your eye here? Um, no, as I said, I think, I think in this, I'm I'm wary of taking short prices about horses who've run well in Maidan and then are coming back at this time of the year. Um, sometimes you can get value back in horses who've not run well in Maidan and then are just happier back in home soil. It's not an, I mean, he's, I climb Express has got everything going for him otherwise, um, but I'm just a little bit wary about taking a short price, whereas um, Dexter Bell, uh, as Andy said, she, she's um, she's got experience at the track. Um, it's you're taking a little bit of a gamble that she's she's as effective at five, um, yeah. but she's she's opened to tons of improvement. So at six to one, I think I'd rather take a chance on her. Um, again, it's it's not a hugely confident call, but it's it's just a it's a value based call. Text to Bell six to one there, bet three six five. Uh, that's the final race we're covering on Thursday. We've got one more to do on Friday, the Yorkshire Cup. Um, but before we do move on, Andy and Rory, Andy, I'll start with you. Anything else on the card on Thursday to look out for at York? Well, I'm a sucker for those uh, mile handicaps. Um, you know, we've had we've had a couple of them. We've had the Lincoln, we've had the Spring Cup, um, form, and we've had the Thurston Cup as well. Mm. All three races have been hugely impressive on the figures. Hakiki, Storting, and I forget the Spring Cup winner now. Rory, help me out. Uh, oh, uh, Nugget also, I think, is a yeah. great horse in, in waiting. He should have won the third Gun Cup, by the way. He 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 got a terrible ride. Um, maybe compensation waits for him at Ascot. Uh, but enough of him. Um, but we've got plenty of refugees um, out of those races. Um, Brunch represents the uh, the Lincoln Form line. He's got an amazing record at York. But Michael Dodds also can't buy a winner at the moment. Uh, oh, sorry, Michael Dodds can't buy a winner at the moment. His horses are a little bit flat. He would be the automatic choice. Uh, based on his overall profile here and his and his and his Lincoln run, um, if the yard is flying a bit better, Matthew Matthew Flinders has run here before pretty well over further. He ran beyond the aforementioned Nugget at Newbury. I thought he caught the eye, uh, and another one at big price who ran out the Thirst Gun Cup um, beyond Storting was Hartswood. Now he's a different kettle of fish altogether because he absolutely adores it here at York. He's a big galloping, long striding unit that Thirst would have been a bit too tight for him. And that was his first run of the season as well. But he only got beat four lengths in the in the first race. And he didn't run too bad. But you look at his record here at uh, York. Just got beat by Brunch um, back here in August. Uh, Ebor meeting. He won the time before. And he was also third over seven furlongs. Trip too short. So his three runs here very much outweigh one or two negatives along the way. Um, and he's 16 to one. So at the prices, I, I, I could see why Brunch and Matthew Flinders, the two sexy ones, are priced up the way they are. Um, but Hartswood, uh, you know, looks slightly overpriced to me. Hartswood, eighteen to one with five eighteen places to one, even better. You give bet. me two point bonus just exactly. by, <laughs> by inquiring about it. Freebie, nobody gives you a bonus. Those bonus and boosts are long gone on your account, Sandy. Uh, Rory, anything for, else for you on the Thursday? Yeah, and, uh, and that's the race I'm interested in as well. I know um, Andy makes the, the point that Michael Dodds is, is finding and um, getting one to. Uh, to get over the line difficult at the moment but i think you know five of his last 15 have have been beaten only a, you know a length and a half or less and the horses are largely running pretty well um so that it's not a question of him being out of form um he's just struggling to you know to rack up winners and i'm ne it never really bothers me i think people tend to look at the bare stats and look at your uh, uh, trainer's strike rate over the last fortnight or the last three weeks 
and make a judgment about how well the horses are running. I prefer to look at percentage of rivals beaten. I prefer to see, um, you know, how, how many winners you would you would have expected out of a sample size, um, and how many of those are are running well, hitting the frame, for example. Easy enough to find those metrics. Um, and I'm happy enough with how, how Michael's horses are running, and I like Brunch enormously. Um, I thought he was, he wasn't unlucky in the Lincoln, but he, he's come to win his race, and Hakiki is, you know, it's just a bit of a freak on the day. Um, but the way the race panned out, Brunch was was ridden, um, handy in midfield, has, has made his move to win the race, and then just got blindsided by the winner. The forms worked out really well, as you would expect of a Lincoln. He'll be more than happy um, back on softish ground. He was a winner and good to soft over course and distance. Uh, last season, and I think, as I said, I think I think you can you can take Hakiki out of the uh, out of the Lincoln. It still looks a decent race, mm -hmm. given that Brunch won that race, um, and has thrown up a number of subsequent winners, subsequent and big race uh, big race winners as well. The Victoria Cup winner, for example, in behind, he's gone up one pound for that, and he's unexposed as a mild handicapper. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, obviously he's he's pretty high rated, but he's only a pound higher than that excellent run last time out. Um, Callum Rodriguez, I think, is, is generally an underrated jockey as well. Uh, he rides York very well, um, and I think he's got a terrific chance. And I'm just hoping that the five people concentrate on the trainer's strike rate might get you a reasonable price about brunch, because I think he should be pretty short. Uh, again, Andy mentioned him as well. I thought Matthew Flinders was the other obvious one in the race, but he's drawn 15 of 15. Um, and the question is uh, what William Butte is going to do from there. I I quite like, I, I always give horses a second look if they're drawn widest of all. Uh, I think, as a rule, you, you crunch the numbers for mile handicaps here at York. You want to be drawn low to mid, as a rule, um, and high draws underperform, generally speaking. Um, even when high draws underperform, it's often the case that the widest stall still does better than the average, because you've got you've got more choices from the widest stall. You, you're not compromised by anything on your outside. Mm. Um, you, obviously, you can buy by those on your inner. Whereas if you're in the middle, you've got horses either side of you to, you know, to limit your options if you're not brilliantly away. Um, if you want to lead and you miss the kick slightly from the widest draw, it's still not that difficult to rush up and, and take a good position. So, uh, again, if you look at all the stats for, for handicaps over a variety of trips, you'll often see um, uh, the, the strike rate fall off as you get to the high numbers. But it tends to peak again slightly with the widest drawn horse. Not always easy to see either, of course, because when you're doing draw analysis, um, yeah. you can't really do it in reverse. You, you know the high numbers are high. You don't know which is the outside stall unless you're specifically looking at field sizes of exactly 15, for example. So it takes a lot more work. Um, but he's, I don't know where I stand with Matthew Flinders at the moment. That may end up being a negative for him, but I'm going to um, to have a close look at, uh, at him and see if I can... Um, argue that he's he's potential value from the worst from what people will assume is the worst <laughs> drop in the race Matthew you've also got a situation there as well uh, just very quickly Rory mm. jockeys who ride those horses from the outside peg have got a better clarity of vision yes because they they're not be say you're drawn 10 or 11 and, and you're kind of looking around what's happening after a furlong and, and almost being led like uh, like you know a herd of sheep aren't you you you're making making other jockeys make your mind up for you what's happening rather than right I'm drawn on the outside I mean that right go forward or take back and so you're the you're the master of your own destiny from the outside That's true, yeah you, you you can survey what's going on in the entirety of the race so yeah, yeah if you if you know if you if you trust the jockey's judgment then it's it's not always a bad place to be because it gives you that option so uh, yeah I um I'd agree with that, but I'm still I'm still not sure whether I'm with the brunch. <laughs> You're definitely with brunch. You're having some brunch. Yeah, brunch, brunch, yeah. brunch, brunch is, is, is definitely um, definitely a solid selection there. Thirteen to two with three six five paddies and sportsbook uh, paddies and sportsbook paying four places, five places with Skybet um, is eleven to two, and then Matthew Finder's pretty much five to one across the board. Final race we're going to be doing in depth is the Yorkshire Cup. We'll do it quickly because we're pushing the hour that we try and stay under. And uh, Andy, you called Saron Priestley well last time out on this show, uh, two to one favourite for the Yorkshire Cup. Santiago is eleven to four second favourite. Nayef Road seven to two. Believe in Love six to one. Uh, Amran Nabifan is seventeen to two. Ten to one Spanish Mission twenty to one bar. Andy, I'll give you the first shot. 
Yeah, you know, well done with that um, pronunciation of the Ana Brian horse. I think it's Am- Amber Amber Vian, isn't it? I think they say oh, it. Right. Is it? Yeah. I thought. Um, see, that was the one I'd practiced. I thought I'd nailed it. Uh, well, come. he's a five to one shot, but he he would have been a he looked like being a fifty five to one shot um, until about half an hour ago when he was withdrawn from the last race at Killarney. But he mm. he missed that, so he might come to York instead. Um, but either way, I don't. I, the, the thing about Saron Police, which I don't like about this race, he's a front runner, and I often find that front runners get gobbled up like they do at Doncaster on this round track. So I think it's harder for him to uh, to implement those front running tactics like he did last time at Newmarket, which was tailor made for his run style. Um, and I prefer his other horse, uh, Mark Johnson, um, Nayef Road. If if you could if you could put one horse in any each way multiple throughout this three, three day meeting, this is the one. Yeah, I mean, he just basically just turns up every time he runs. He's never out the frame. I thought his run beyond Embihar in the, um, was it the Lonsdale? Um, towards mm. the back end of last season was excellent. Uh, but once again, he tried to make quite a bit of the running or he was, he was pressing the pace at Ascot last time out, which is not the way to ride the round track at Ascot. But um, it's perfectly okay at York if you're just sort of in behind the speed. So I'd, I'd imagine Sir Ron Priest will lead here and Nayef Road will be sort of second or third no worst uh, and that's where i want to be here at york um just just off the speed and challenging latest rather than trying to make all and and you know go go down that long bursting straight having made the running so i'll be with naf road here naf road seven or two with hills who incidentally the only firm still paying three places which suggests this race is going to cut up a fair bit in the next couple of days uh, rory um yeah, I, I um, largely agree with Andy there. There's the the elephant in the room here, again, is the going. So Ron Priestley's got a tremendous record in good or quicker going. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, since stepping up in trip, um, the only time he's been beaten on good or quicker was um, in the St. Ledger. Um, but he did <laughs> one run on, on ground on the soft side of good, and he ran badly. Um, and that's it. He's only once in his entire life run on anything softer than good, and he was he was um, beaten. Um, I, won't say, I won't say out of sight. He was thirteenth of sixteen um, at Royal Ascot in the King George V Stakes. So that's a, that's a big worry. Uh, if the grind is not is not quick, it's against him. As Andy says, you don't always want to be the hare here at, on the round track at York. Uh, and my my issue with with Nayef Road, um, a he might need at least two miles these days. Of course, he was second in the Gold Cup last year, but in, while he ran well um, in the um, in the Lonsdale Cup last year, that was his third run at York and the third time that he hasn't um, repaid each way support. Um, he's been unplaced in his other two runs as well. So that's a little bit of a worry. Um, it's only a, it's only a minor worry if you if you say he's been unplaced in three runs. It sounds worse than it is because he's been beaten a length and a half in a Group Two. Yeah. on his last start but whether whether this trip is just on the sharp side for him is a question as well so i'm inclined to sort of step away from the um um the johnson horses and the o'brien horses i'm not a, i'm not a massive fan of santiago i have to say is you know he was well talked up last year um he did well but he was very forward um and i think i think he you know his, his win in the irish derby was because he was um he he was battle hardened at that stage having won at royal ascot already um, I don't massively rate that form. He is very good. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that he's um, that he's short of this class, but I think he's always going to be the kind of horse who's overbet in races like this. I thought Believe and Love might just be the one to be with, um, with with question marks about a few. Um, Andrea Atzani jogged up for Roger Varian, so she looks like she's going to run. Uh, she was very progressive last year, um, and she proved that she handled um, digging the ground by producing. Um, a, a smart performance to win the Group 3 pre Belle de Nuit a San Clou in her final start. Um, she'd, um, she'd been very impressive, uh, uh, only in a handicap uh, at Newmarket in August, but she won by 10 lengths over this trip and good to soft ground uh, in a very good time. And I think she might end up being a bit underrated here. Believe in love then for Rory, six to one best price at the moment. That's with Unibet. Uh, we're going to finish up now, but before we do, any others for you guys on Friday? Uh, yeah, just very quickly for me, a uh, horse that I nominated as one of my horses to follow for the season runs in the um, 210, the Michael Seeley. Um, Snow Lantern, no mm. prizes for originality really, having picked up out a horse who was wildly impressive first time out, but the clock said uh, Snow Lantern's group class, and hopefully she can prove that 
on to better things throughout the rest of the season. And probably one of the most eye-catching horses of the entire season for me so far. And I'm desperate for connections to drop the horse back down in trip, uh, but they haven't done here, is Blue Cap, who pr- would have won, I think, the... Was it the City and Sub or the Great Mess? I can't remember, never remember uh, which one's which. Uh, yeah. It was the City, City and Sub. City and Suburban, yeah. Oh, God, I mean, that got... That got a horrific run through and was literally full of running as a, as a it never had a race. Well, um, I mean, I laughed at that day so well. Oh, I, well, I, you know the story, Roy. <laughs> I mean, but I, I think that horse is tailor made for something like the Hunt Cup because he's got such a high cruising speed. Um, but being held up in a Hunt Cup over a stiff mile where he hasn't got to worry about track position going around bends because I think that's his problem. Because sometimes he gets too far back because of his hold at, hold at run star. But I think, you know, if they split to two groups in a hunt cut where you've got 15 one side, 15 the other, and you've only got, only got a certain amount of horses to aim at, and he's at the back, you stick Jamie Spencer on him in a hunt cut, well, goodness me, he'd do a right number on that field. Um, so he'd be my big uh, big investment on um, on on Friday. No but, he, but he has been found in the market. Yeah, seven out of six to four. Blue Cup currently seven to two best price at the moment yeah. for the uh, for the handicap on Friday. Rory, anything for you? Well, I'd, yeah, as I said, I, I was um, I was with Blue Cup last time out. Um, uh, he was very weak in the market later on that day. Uh, he looked like he was going to he was going to go a favour in the morning, and he's ended up drifting to thirteen to two on the off. Because mm. um, I ended up I ended up going in again as you do when a horse you <laughs> fancy drifts, um, which does occasionally work. But yeah, it was it was a nightmare. Um, he, he was still on the bridle, passing the line, beating less than two and a half lengths. But the problem with that is, you know, normally um, you back a horse who goes off at 13 to two and finishes fifth. Um, you'd like to think you can get at least 13 to two in a stronger race next time out, but you're not yeah. going to. So that's, <laughs> yeah, that's slightly off-putting. Um, I'll, I'll, I suspect you might get a better price on the day with him. And, and given that he drifted late on, I'd be inclined to just be just watch the market and, and bet late on that race. But as long as he's um, uh, reasonably solid in the market compared to his, you know, his opening show, um, then I'd be uh, I'd be fairly confident with him. Um, as Andy says, you know, maybe he's a type of horse to do to do better at a track like Ascot, um, where wh- whether the mile is is stiff enough for him in a race like the Hunt Cup, or um, whether he needs a mile and a quarter. Um, but he's he's caught the eye. He caught the eye of Deauville on his final start last season. I thought uh, Michael Barcelona gave him a give him a horrible ride, um, and he finished full of running that day as well. So he's clearly got a big race in him off his current mark. But you know the market is ahead of you at the moment. Yeah, seven or two, maybe a bit prohibitive given the SP last time out, as Rory says, in a uh, in a weaker race probably than this one here. Um, thank you very much to both Rory and to Andy for giving us their thoughts ahead of the week's racing at York. Please do make sure to follow them on social media and you can find Andy's tips every morning of racing, not just at York, but every morning throughout the year uh, with the Odds Checker app. You can also get the best uh, prices, the best um, bookie offers, free bets, place terms, and all sorts of other things as well. So do download that now. Also, please subscribe to the uh, the Odds Checker YouTube channel. Loads of preview content throughout the season's racing and other sports as well. And please do subscribe to the podcast and all podcast platforms too. Fingers crossed we've flagged up some value, hopefully a couple of winners in there as well. And please do gamble responsibly.